I'm so thrilled uh, to, to have John Brewer here uh, with all this knowledge of synth and modular synth, and so take it away. Cool. Have a seat. I'm going to see if there's anybody else I, lost. I kind of like sitting in the front. So what do you all know about modular synths? Yeah, it's a synth yeah. that modulates. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean that's kind of a funny. Uh, yeah, there are, there is modulation happening, but the name modular comes from the design of having individual modules that are self-contained, but they can be connected together, cables to form a larger system, and so. Uh, I'll get to why this talk is going to be called, or is called, Instruments Smarter Than Us. Um, but, yeah, so I have two different systems here. Uh, this is a Eurorack case, and this is made by a guy in London. Uh, his company name is Destiny Plus, but it's just one guy doing everything himself. Um, so, I want to give you a little bit of context, a little bit of background, but I'm going to kind of blow through it really fast, so that way we have more time to make cool sounds and talk about this diagram and uh, all kinds of interesting stuff. So just right at the outset, I, I wanted to quantify the difference between a fully modular system and a semi-modular system. So this is an example of a, a Buchla 200E. Uh, has anyone ever heard of Buchla? No, okay, all right, cool. Um, so it's kind of similar to this, except uh, th this is three rack units high. So like, you know you, how you have your outboard gear in the studio, rack units. Uh, this is three rack units and Buchla is four rack units. That's not super important, but uh, just some differences. And so this is, um, has anyone ever seen these? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Moog, recently came out with DFAM, Mother32, and Subharmonicon. They're a semi-modular semi system. Uh, so each, each one of these panels is a self-contained instrument. And it provides patch points so that you can connect, uh, connect them different ways and kind of change the preset functions. But um, you don't have to use cables. You can just plug it in and start making sounds with it. Whereas with a fully modular system like this, or that one, or that Buchla, uh, you have to start connecting patch cables to get anything out of it. So it kind of, it's all based on um, signal flow and understanding what things are doing what, uh, and then managing those signals. So the objectives of what I wanna talk about today, uh, a little bit about the history and development. Again, I'm skipping over 98% of it uh, because we have very limited time. But just to give you some context, then I want to talk about compositional affordances of it. If that doesn't make sense, then good, you'll learn today. Um, and then I want to talk about generative music algorithms. So, first we'll talk about the history and development. <coughs> Who's that guy? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm sure everyone is familiar with the name Moog, Robert Moog. Um, his name is never far from any sentence <laughs> spoken about synthesizers. So him and Don Buchla were contemporaries. And most people think about Moog when they think about synthesizers. They'll call him the godfather of the synthesizer, but it kind of depends on who you're asking uh, because Technically speaking, Don started selling his modular synths before uh, Bob Moog, but they were contemporaries. They were both working at the same time. They were both commissioned by composers who wanted to explore new sonic territories. Ooh. Um, but and this is how you'll hear this is how you'll hear it referred to. Um, the differences between Buchla and Moog systems is kind of the East Coast, West Coast. Has anyone ever heard that? East Coast synthesis. So what's East Coast then? What do you think, Jesse? Is East? I don't remember. I've like heard of the divide before. Is 
I feel like was Mo from California, so it's backwards. Backwards. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Don Buchla uh, was in California, and Mo was based in North Carolina. I think a lot of his work was done in New York. Um, we're, the, we're on the East Coast, and we know about Moog, but not Buchla. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's also tied up in cultural paradigms as well. I mean, if you think about California and San Francisco, what do you what do you think of? Beach. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair <laughs> beach. Um, but what about the like culture there? Mm, is that New music? Yeah, it's more explorative. I mean, that's where the whole hippie movement came from, right? You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's a little more liberal, more exploratory, um, whereas Moog was kind of the opposite. So the main difference is the player interface, because they're both modular since you can connect them how you want it. But how the player interacts with, with them is very different. And that created different music. So. This is an example using a Moog modular system. Uh, is anyone familiar with Wendy Carlos? Yeah. No. Yeah. So, as far as I know, this is still the best-selling classical music record of all time, as far as I know. Um, which is pretty crazy because it's electronic music, but uh, it's Bach. So Wendy did a series of arrangements for the Moog modular synthesizer uh, of Bach pieces. And that I think that kind of encapsulates uh, Moog's approach. What do you see here that might push it in that direction just in terms of player interface? Yeah, the keyboard, exactly. So Moog said, you know, if people people understand the keyboard, understand piano, if I put it if I put a keyboard with this instrument, they'll naturally be able to do it. So then on the other side, yeah, on the other side of the country, we have Don Buchla, and he was commissioned by Mort, Morton Sabotnik. Has anyone ever heard of Morton Sabotnik? Okay. Um, <laughs> I think you can agree this is a different musical territory. And it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but he doesn't have any sort of keyboard interface like this. Um, I have a sequencer here. So mostly Buchla systems used sequencers or just ways of connecting things such that they generate music rather than the player determining, I want this note now, I want this note now. Um, so it's less of a top-down approach. We're dialing up like when Spongebob now. Sounds like that. When Squidward gets to the future. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> future! <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think, honestly, that music was probably kind of modeled after Morton Sabotnik. Um, he was very afraid that people were going to hate his music. And there's a, there's a whole lot of synth history after him. I mean, there's so many people we can talk about, different modular systems, how they developed, how they, they were left aside for a long time because, like, the Yamaha DX7 came out, digital synthesizers, and everyone was like, analog, throw it out. We want digital. Um, but now we've kind of come back to it, and a big reason is the emergence of Eurorack systems. So Eurorack is, is this system here, and it's basically a standard of the voltage used inside, the power supply voltage, um, the width of the modules, and well, that, that pretty much covers it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's this format that was standardized by Dieter Dopfer, which is the maker of this system. And this is like a, a pre-made system that you can buy from Dopfer, and it has all sorts of different functions in each module that are represented. Uh, but you can also, obviously, buy modules from different manufacturers. And so this is my system here. There are a couple modules that I'm working on getting that are in there. It's wishful thinking right now. Um, but yeah, I've, I've combined modules from different manufacturers 
uh, in Struo, after later audio, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about specific functions because I think in your all synthesis unit, you've talked about filter, filters, oscillators, envelopes. Are you familiar with those terms? Yeah? Okay. All right. Well, that's good because uh, that would compl complicate this a lot <laughs> if, if not. Um, but so this is just, this kind of caused a resurgence and there are now thousands upon thousands of, of modules available. I'm something like five or six thousand from hundreds of different manufacturers. It's really popular now. Um, and lots of people are using it in different ways. Because the nature of it being modular, it can be adapted to all sorts of different playing styles. You can use a keyboard with it. For the type of music that I'm interested in and that I make, I don't use it because I find that it makes me make music that you know might resemble Wendy Carlos more than it would resemble Morton Subotnik, and I'm heavily inspired by Morton Subotnik, so I aim to compose differently. Um, but there are plenty of other formats that have emerged after Eurorack. So 3U is Eurorack, 4U is this is kind of a standalone thing, so it doesn't really count. Um, 5U, so that's like Moog modular. There are new versions of that. A module uses tiny little cables, Seat Lombard. I mean, there's, it just goes on and on and on. Um, lots of innovations in the area. So now, let's talk about compositional affordances. What do I mean by that? Take a guess. How much room you're given in your workspace when it comes to making your music? In yeah. Terms of flexibility. Effort? Okay. Yeah. 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 That's a great way to think about it. What else? Michael. Why are you putting me on the spot? Well, just make a guess. Um, how much? Like something? I don't know. <laughs> affordable. What? Okay, could be. Um, it, when you're starting out making the music uh, outside of the box, like uh, I forget what his name is, opposite of Moog, um, <laughs> then it allows you to continue to build outside of the box rather than confining yourself with compositional rules or any such thing. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, when we talk about affordances, we're talking about the allowance of the instrument, or the possibilities of the instrument. And we don't tend to think about instruments in this way, and this is something that I've come to recently, uh, a book by Thor Magnuson that I just read um, called Sonic Writing, where he compares you know, different ways that we inscribe music, both sheet music, um, in recordings, but also in the instruments themselves. So, what's luthery? What does that mean? It's like uh, the building of like string instruments, I believe. Yeah, right. Yeah, so normally a luthier is someone who makes string instruments. Uh, I've seen it in the literature kind of be co-opted to refer to instrument making in general, just because it's a cool sounding word, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a form of music inscription. So inscription is I mean, you could think about it like carving something in stone or writing it down, um, but it goes beyond that. So the technological potential of any given instrument, piano, guitar, flute, oboe, voice, drums, uh, the potentials of that instrument drive the music that you can make with it. For example, what can you not do on a piano? Microtonal music. <laughs> Microtonal music, what? Play lower than the lowest note on it. Play lower than the lowest note. What else? Crescendo a single note. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yes. So all of those factors determine the type of music that you can play with it. You can't do those things, so you don't. So the music doesn't have that. <laughs> um, I mean, you can think about uh, the addition of uh, a register on the harpsichord creating dynamics. And then when the piano came out, ha actually having control over those dynamics, I mean, the people were just flabbergasted. Like, what? What is this? There are more than two loudness levels? Um, you know, so the instrument determines the music you make with it. And uh, I, I really like this quote. Phil, read that. 
against the logic that sees musical instruments as a direct channel for our musical thoughts, seamless media that materialize our imagination. The critical analytics of musical instruments reveals them as epistemic objects with agency as technologies that are not supposed to merely channel, but also to converse, resist, challenge, surprise, and reject the performer. All right, CJ, what does that mean? Oh, I'm not going to lie. That first part lost me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the second part, though, made sense. It okay. basically means that um, the technological potential of a um, instrument is not just to be an extension of the performer, but it, it, is, it itself is also a living, breathing entity. Well said. Absolutely. Yeah, so we tend to not consider, uh, like if you take guitar, that's what I studied, my, both my degrees are in guitar. Um, with the guitar, if you set it on the floor and say, play music, go, do it, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to do anything. Um, and, you know, when you're playing it, generally speaking, unless something is going wrong with it physically, um, it's not going to give you much feedback. It's not going to direct your decisions in an active way. It's more like you have to overcome the instrument. You have to be better than it. That's why we practice technique, so that the limitations of the instrument or the difficulties of the instrument can be overcome. But uh, with creating musical systems, which is kind of what I'm talking about here, you you kind of cherish those well that conversation the resistance the challenge uh the surprise and the rejection of, of whatever you do because that generates new musical forms that you couldn't otherwise make because it's not a top down it's not the human deciding this yeah i have this perfect idea up here and now i'm trying to realize it it's it's more an extension of the mind. So has anyone ever heard about this concept that tools extend the mind? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, what, is, what do I mean by that? I probably have it here. <laughs> you can use like tools to like better your ideas essentially? Like, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So by using a tool, and it could be literally a marker or a shoe or, like or a screwdriver what I was saying like the marker like you can use it to write down your ideas or something. yeah absolutely and that it, like me I, I personally I have to have something physical in front of me to really manipulate my thoughts well and so I can't think clearly unless I'm writing things down and looking at it and analyzing it from that physical perspective um, but this extends to lots of things so um, basically, the affordances or the possibilities with any given tool, i.e. an instrument, uh, determine how we think. So if we create systems that are, going back to the name of the talk, smarter than us, or in a way we can't predict them, then we are creating music that is, could be more complex or just different in ways that we don't even plan or that are beyond our planning. But then that develops uh, our ability to manage these systems ra rather than a, a, from a top-down approach, um, more, I guess, bottom-up. So this brings us to generative music. Has anyone ever heard of generative music? No? All right. So there are tons and tons of examples of this, especially now that uh, Eurorack has become much more popular but let me switch I don't know why this is not there we go all right so generative music could be ambient so state visitor is a pretty big YouTube channel he, he does these like four hour long videos where he sets up a patch and then just leaves it Yeah, pretty much. Um, but th 
the term generative is referring to the the way in which it's created. It's not necessarily uh, restrictive of how it sounds. It has more to do with um, the method with which it's created. And so here's an example of uh, like a, an electronic musician, Richard Devine. Um, so he's using generative processes, but it's, it doesn't sound like a gear, but a lot of it's like dance oriented. Let's see if I can find yeah. yeah, so and he's actively in, you know, working with it, interfacing with it, making changes because he's performing. Uh, where's the other guy? He was left it totally unattended. So some examples of more traditional composers. Uh, John Cage used generative processes. Uh, Brian Eno, his music for airports. Um, and there's all sorts of different methods, but basically the measuring stick is can you accurately predict the results? If not, then it's, it's kind of a generative system. Um, but there are lots of different ways that that it can look lots of different ways. Um, so it's about creating some sort of complex system that creates music, right? All right. And then before we get on to the this guy, I just want to make sure that we understand how modular synths work, basically. Uh, voltage. So any idea of what voltage is? What does that mean? What is voltage? Electricity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, you can think about it that way. Um, really, it's it's a gradient. It means it's you think about it like magnets. So with magnets, there's a, a gradient. It wants to pull one direction, right? That's what gradient means. Um, and modular sense use that gradient to communicate. So it's it's a system of communication, like MIDI might be. Except with MIDI, what? How, how does MIDI work? Is it digital, analog, both? Um, MIDI is like just a signal, right? Is it kind of like just information? If when you it's, actually put it into it something, that it turns into something. But it's formalized information. Right. Yeah, so it, uh, it, MIDI has a, um, what's the word? The committee for MIDI in the 80s, they uh, uh, came out with a set of standards and that formalized the MIDI standard. And basically, it's just a way MIDI, of. MIDI committee, oh my god. <laughs> MIDI committee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so <laughs> rather than. Um, rather than using MIDI, which uses digital. Uh, a digital standard, so it ones and zeros. It's this is using an analog standard, and Eurorack is between negative ten and positive ten volts. It can be positive or negative, and basically you can just think about it as a stream of numbers, a value. So it's essentially infinitely precise because it's analog, it's electrons. Um, so leg up on MIDI there. MIDI is not infinitely precise. If you've ever played with a filter through a MIDI CC control, you can hear the steps in, in uh, this, the MIDI control because it's not infinitely precise. So voltage can look like many, many different things. It could look like, so here we have our scale, right? Um, here's zero volts, let's say 10 volts and minus 10 volts, all right? So, and then this is time. Okay, so it could look like what we call a pulse wave. So it could look like that. Or um, it could be a sine wave. Or it could be noise. <laughs> right? So um, it can be anything 
And here's a helpful way to think about the entire spectrum of possible signals that you can have. What is the simplest sound? What is the simplest sound? Mm, claps are actually fairly complex. Noisy. Sine wave. Yes. So a sine wave is the simplest sound possible. It has only one frequency it, if it's a perfect sine wave. That tends not to happen, practically speaking. But yeah, a sine wave has only one frequency. Um, have you talked about harmonics and frequency spectrum? OK, yeah. So on a frequency spectrum plot, a sine wave will have one spike because it, it won't have any harmonics. But if we do something like a saw wave, this is a bad saw wave, um, <laughs> it will have, I think it's all of the odd harmonic all the odd harmonics, and then each one is a third the amplitude of the previous. So a third the amplitude, a third the amplitude, a third the amplitude. Infinite times, theoretically. Um, so these, this would be the frequency. So if our fundamental is, I don't know, 100, then the next harmonic, I guess, would be 200, I guess? I don't know. Don't quote me on that. Yeah. 200. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then on and on and on. Yeah. With increasing or decreasing amplitude. So that's a harmonic spectrum. Okay. So the range of sounds that we can represent goes from a sine wave to noise, which is utter random chaos. You, we, our ears can't pick anything out of it other than just Right. Okay. Just like the noise flow that I'm hearing right now. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, about that. Yeah. All right. So I say practically speaking, because if you do any study in electrical engineering, voltage is definitely not one dimensional. It's part of an equation. There's amperage and uh, resistance. But as far as it matters with modular sense, it's one dimensional. What do I mean by that? Is it like you just said that it wants to do one thing? Yeah, I think that I think that gets at it. Is that you can only have one signal, like on a cable. Um, if you you if you try to put two signals into it, it's going to have they're going to interact, and it could be an average, it could be a sum, it could be a difference. Um, there are lots of ways that voltage can be operated on, and it can all be represented in mathematics. But that doesn't really come up much with modular sense. Um, but understanding that you can do operations on voltage helps understanding the signal flow side of it. So you can sum two signals together or mix them. You can subtract them, uh, like with mid-side. Are you all familiar with mid-side? OK, yeah. So the mid is the sum of the two signals, and the side is the difference. So you can do that with a modular synth. Um, you can multiply them together. Anyone heard of a ring modulator? So that's when you multiply two audio signals. Um, and then you can change its amplitude, the phase, blah, blah, blah. But you'll only have one signal in any given cable. You're not going to have two signals channel, you know, being ran in the same cable. All right. All right, let's move on to this. So now that we got the voltage part out of the way, this is called a curl patch. Is anyone familiar with, or what? What is the first uh, first movie with an electronic, fully electronic soundtrack? Isn't it a Disney movie? No. Oh, okay. It's Tron, right? Nope. Um, I don't know if it was seen as a horror movie, but maybe it was so long ago it might have been horror at that time. It's probably more sci-fi than horror. I've never seen the full Alien. movie. Huh? Alien. Alien. <laughs> you know? Is it the blob? No. Oh, it's not. Okay. No, no yeah, I, I don't know. Doctor what is it? Little. It's uh. Oh shoot! Now. I'm <laughs> uh, Forbidden Planet. Oh, 
Yeah. I think it was in the 40s. Fifth, for, late 40s? I thought it was 40s, yeah. 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 Um, so, one of the posters in the next Babe, over. Babe, or is it Babe I don't know, and yeah. Louis Barron, um, they were using old studio electronics and tape and made all sorts of really crazy sounds, like things that people today still like hear as being alien, but it was in the 40s. Um, so there was this ancient race of robots on a planet they're called krill and they um nobody knows exactly how they did it in the studio but a guy by the name of todd barton he's a popular educator with modular sense he posts short little uh modular patches on his youtube channel almost daily but uh, he came up with this patch called a krill patch that kind of emulates at least how uh they sounded in the movie it's not you know, one to one with how it was created, but it's it's meant to emulate what it sounds like. So let me. So I'm going to pull all these patch cables, start from the beginning, and kind of go through setting this up. Um, and this is just one generative music algorithm. It's not the best that it sounded, <laughs> but um, you know, just getting it set up. That's essentially what it is. But let's start from the beginning. Oh my god! Oh. 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 Sorry, just like the musician in me is like infernally screaming for you. What? Why's that? Huh? Why? Because it's like it's like undoing. <laughs> that just like it's like undoing a all a finished product and having to restart it from scratch. I'm like that's the beautiful part. Okay. It um, <laughs> it's it's actually an incredibly freeing feeling. Uh, like I sometimes I'll leave a patch. Uh, connected for days or even weeks and then some I'll just reach a point where I'm like okay I'm done and then just pull all of them out and it's just like oh <laughs> it's so nice it, uh, it's starting from scratch and every time sometimes if I'm trying to build on a patch and make it better I'll redo it because in that process of reconnecting everything um, you know you're kind of like working through your knowledge and you find new things so it's uh, it's actually a feature, not a bug. <laughs> um, all right. So, what's VCO mean? Voltage controlled oscillator. Bingo. VCA. Guess. Voltage uh, control. Voltage control. Um, audio. I don't know. Yeah, you um, can think about it like that. Um, amplifier. Amplifier. VCF. Voltage controlled. Fre fre yeah, frequency. Frequency so is yeah. It's a uh, <laughs> uh, filter. So you have a, an oscillator, an amplifier, and a filter. Oh, we learned about this. 
Um, all right. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh my God, we learned about that. Next is gonna be a BC news So I'm gonna connect. Not quite. So I'm gonna take my oscillator into my filter here, and then take that out. Oh no, sorry. Kind of backwards. Into my VCA, and then out of the VCA into the filter, and then out of the filter to our output. So we can hear it. Sounds great. Okay. <laughs> generative component. So now we're going to create a system that will control this in a way that makes interesting results. So we have a looping AD envelope and this is going to control the amplitude of our VCA. So I'll take um, here I have this quadrax module made by IntelliJ. It has four channels and it they can serve different functions. Um, and if you look here, you see this blinking green light. And that's just a representation of the signal that will be coming out of that output. So if I take that, notice it's all green. That means it's all in the positive direction. Because if we amplify something negative, not going to work. Um, we won't get anything. You can do that. It will flip the polarity, but you have to have a ring modulator, or also called a four quadrant multiplier because it can multiply in positive and negative directions. So now we're basically subtracting uh, the wave so that we don't just have a droning note, but we have you know a pattern, a rhythm. Alright? So now channels
sounds like you wouldn't notice the difference at all. But um, I'll let you be the judge of that. Outputs here on the side that say end of rise, end of fall, um, and basically this envelope is split into two sections. You have the rise, um, which I can make long, so it it grows up to the highest point, and then it falls down to the lowest point before it begins again, right? Uh, but you can see here once the envelope restarts, I'm getting a little light out of here. So that's a trigger that it's sending out, which looks like, I already erased it. So every time our envelope, say if this is our envelope, every time it restarts, which would be right here, it, it will send a pulse out of that output. So we can use that to trigger other things. So for example, I have what's called a sample and hold module. Does anyone know what sample and hold does? What that means? Sample and hold? All right. I'm going to fill this board up. Um, so sample and hold does exactly what it sounds like. So you have... So sample? Sample? <laughs> Um, you have a sample input, so you put something in here, you'll have a trigger input, so I'll say SAM, trig, and then you have an output. Okay, so you put some sort of signal and in this case, we're, we want to make a stepped random, so we're going to use, and actually I can let you hear this, the, one of the cool things about voltage is that it's universal, only the shapes are different. You can use any signal to control any other signal and affect it in any way. So we can use, instead um, as an input to our sample and hold module, what's going to happen is whenever it receives a pulse, a trigger, on this trigger input, it's going to sample the value of that random signal, which means we'll get a random value. So when it hit, whenever you get a trigger in this, it's going to sample this and put something out here. So we get a signal that looks like this, stepped random. So it'll hold it change, hold it, change, hold it, etc. So we can use that to to control really fun to listen to. So how to, what do you think we could do to make it a little more listenable. Remembering that we can process the, our voltage in different ways. What does it sound like is happening that you could maybe change? Um, the, the high notes? Yeah, but the side doesn't like peak. Yeah, right. So we have a really wide range of voltages that are that is being sent to this oscillator. And so the lowest note is below audio. You hear it as clicks. And then the highest one is like, you know, it makes your ears bleed. Um, so we, we will process it through an attenuator, which is just like 
a, a pot on a mixer or a whatever. And I see here, like all that is is a potentiometer. It attenuates the signal. So I'll attenuate the signal and then send it to the oscillator. So now it's a little more controlled. It's within a smaller range. All right. And then I'm going to use one of these stacking cables to send a copy of one of our smooth random to the filter cutoff frequency. That's a little more characteristic. So, in the end, it, it kind of sounds like some alien robot talking a language that you don't understand. So we could use, we could take the, uh, we could take the smooth random, one of the smooth random. That one hard. That actually. And so this is called a complex oscillator. A complex oscillator is just two oscillators that can interact with one another. And so if we take that smooth random signal to what's called the index, that's just um, so we have two VCOs, and then the index is just like a VCA. That's all it is. And it, it is sending, um, to, to control the frequency of both oscillators, we can change that. granular processor to create the other sound. Those are generative music systems. Oh, I have this here. This is like a drum machine. Um, and the way it creates rhythm, rhythm is also generative. I won't, I'll spare you the detail of how it does that. But basically, it's kind of hard to predict the pattern that will come out. You can, you can kind of understand the signals that are going in to create the rhythms. But then the pattern that you get out is kind of hard to predict. But that's what makes it fun. So. Yeah, 
so generative music is not something that is um, specific to modular synths. Like I mentioned, John Cage and all those other composers that have done things or that have created generative musical systems uh, for their music. But I think it's something that the modular synth does particularly well because you have access to all of those musical parameters at any point. Um, so you can make connections and create a system that makes music rather than make the music yourself. Questions? What type of cables are they? Are they auxiliary cables? Uh, they're mono... Mono... Uh, three and a half millimeter cables. Three and a half millimeter. Oh, cool. These these are banana cables, which is uh, is borrowed from like scientific instruments and lab equipment. Like if you've ever used a um, a multimeter multimeter, it has it has a banana banana jacks. And then this here is what's called a format jumbler. It just switches between this type of cable and this type of cable, so I can interface these two systems. Format jumper is a fun, fun name. No questions? Nothing. He's blowing my mind. I have no questions. <laughs> my brain sounds like sense right now. Oh, <laughs> let me, and I want to show, I want to show you all this really, really quick. My brain is a sense signal. Um, if, if you're interested at all, at all in modular sense, oh. um, I would recommend. I would recommend checking out this program called VCV Rack. It's free, completely free, and there are thousands and thousands of modules with thousands and thousands of functions. So you can build your own modular synth patches, and I use it all the time. I like using it for mixing, um, for you know creating patches, or you, you could just use it for effects. Uh, you can interface it with MIDI, with OSC, all sorts of things. Totally, totally free. Did you say VCZ? VCV, right? Yeah. Right. That would be something, your job is to create an instrument for the 20, 27th of November. Um, what what we've looked at so far wasn't generative. It was synthesis. It was, it was with the keyboard connected, how we can play it. Um, but, but to do something like this that would be generative, um, you could, you, you, we could connect your computer. So for some of you who were like, I can't get to the lab, that's something that you could do. So yeah, check that out.